Hello, my name is Morwenna Dudlow. I work in the Department of Theology and Religion and I study early Christian history and theology. And today I'm going to be talking to you about why I think it's so important to understand early Christians in their own particular context. Well, I don't know about you, but coronavirus has made me think more deeply about the world. It's made me reevaluate what is normal. It's made me ask what is really important. We all have to respond in similar kinds of ways when we face a crisis. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how four early Christians responded to crises in their own particular contexts. I'm going to start with Roman North Africa. That is the area on the map here indicated in red. Now, Christianity began um, to the east of the Mediterranean in that area underneath the text on that map there, and it spread to begin with to the east. But gradually, Christianity began to spread around the shores of the Mediterranean coast um, and going into many parts of the Roman Empire. The people I'm going to be talking about first are two men called Tertullian and Augustine. Tertullian lived in Roman North Africa from the 2nd to the 3rd centuries and Augustine from the 4th to the 5th centuries. Just to give you some context, this was about the time when Hadrian's Wall was built in Britain. That was 122 um, CE. So let's start with Tertullian. So Tertullian lived from 155 to 240 CE. He was an African. That's how he describes himself. But he clearly had a Roman education, the kind of thing which being part of the Roman Empire gave him access to. Around about this time, the Roman emperor too was a North African, Septimius Severus. It was a time when people from the further reaches of the Roman Empire were beginning to be able to have more of a share in power. However, Tertullian himself was a Christian, and this made him and his community vulnerable because it was a period where Christians were not allowed um, always to worship um, in freedom. Sometimes they lived perfectly naturally, but at other times, particularly when things went wrong, the local population would blame everything on the Christians. And we've got a quote here from Tertullian who describes such a crisis. They, that's the local townspeople, they think the Christians the cause of every public disaster, of every affliction with which the people are visited. If the Tiber rises as high as the city walls, if the Nile does not send its waters up over the fields, if the heavens give no rain, if there is an earthquake, if there is famine or pestilence, straightway the cry is, away with the Christians to the lion. So what Tertullian's suggesting here is if something goes wrong, the local population blame these Christians because they're different. And it is true, we know that some Christians in this period were executed. Tertullian's response to this crisis is not to give up being a Christian, but to advise his local community, you have to choose. You have to choose between your loyalty to God and to your loyalty to some other things you might have been doing. You can't serve God and the emperor. And in particular, he was asked whether you could be a soldier in the emperor's army. And his response to that was a clear no. You cannot be a Christian and be a soldier. Well, now I'm going to flip forward uh, two centuries to St. Augustine. Uh, still living in the same kind of area. He came from a very average family, like Tertullian, he was an African, but with a Roman education. And in this case, Augustine's education took him out of Africa to Italy, to Rome and Milan to pursue a career. But he converted to Christianity and came back to Africa to found monasteries and to be a bishop, a leading Christian in his area. By this stage, most of the Roman emperors had been Christian for a while. Many people in power were Christian. Not everybody was, 
but it was safe to be Christian in this period. So you might ask me, well, so what crisis then? But the crisis for Augustine came not from within the empire, but from outside it, as you can see from this map. Now, you don't need to worry about all of the arrows here. It's a bit complicated. But the point is that northern European tribes were moving from their homelands to start encroaching on the Roman Empire from different directions. You can see some Roman tri some tribes um, had sacked the city of Rome. Those are the lines in pink. But I want you to focus on the blue line because that is the tribe of the Vandals who travelled west and then south through Gaul and Iberia. That's what we would call France and Spain and Portugal. And they crossed over to North Africa where they began to threaten North Africa and the city of Carthage itself. In this context, there was a sense of crisis. And somebody asked Augustine, well, can I be a soldier? Knowing that in the past, Christians had advised their fellow um, believers not to be a soldier. And unsurprisingly, Augustine's answer changes. He said, yes, you can be a soldier if, if your purpose is to preserve and to fight for peace. So two situations, same question, but a different answer. And I think this is important because the question of pacifism is still debated by Christians today. Should Christians go to war? And there are committed and devout uh, people who, for good conscience reasons, have different answers to that question. And I think by going back and looking at Tertullian and Augustine, who were both sincere Christians, who took the Bible very, very seriously, both of them, but gave different answers because of their own specific situations. Now, I don't just want to look at the men in early Christianity. I'd like us to take a look now at two early Christian women. The first of these was known as Perpetua. Like Tertullian, she was an African with a Roman education. She lived in Carthage, and because she was educated, she was probably quite a wealthy woman. But as a woman, she was expected, um, as the main focus of her life, to marry and to raise a family. And in the story we have about Perpetua, we first meet her as a young woman with a tiny baby but we meet her because she's been arrested for being a Christian. It looks very much as though she was a leader in her Christian community. She was someone who others looked to for spiritual authority. She may have been a prophetess, but she certainly was a leader in her group. And as such, something had clearly um, provoked the Roman authorities some of the leaders of the Christian community were arrested and taken to be put in prison. And the reason we know about Perpetua's story is probably because she dictated it herself to friends who came to visit her while she was there, because the story about Perpetua is told in her own words. Finally, though, another voice, another author takes over her story at the end and we learn that Perpetua was executed because of her Christian faith. So her response to a similar kind of crisis as that which Tertullian described was to face up to the danger of confessing her beliefs, to give up her family, to give up her baby son and to be prepared to be arrested, imprisoned and in the end, executed. I'm going to do the same thing with these women as I did with the men. I'm going to flip forward two centuries and now we're going to look at Macrina, who lived in the Roman province of Cappadocia, which is marked in red on this map. Um, it's part of what we would now call Turkey. Now, Macrina came from a wealthy and aristocratic family she was the oldest of 10 children. I sometimes refer to her as the bossiest big sister in all of Christianity because she told the others exactly what she wanted them to do. And 
she, like Perpetua, was expected as a woman to marry. But Macrina refused. Uh, she did not want to marry. And instead, she decided to turn her aristocratic household into a community of like-minded women who wanted to dedicate their lives to prayer, to study and to charity, to looking after those who were less well off than themselves. Macrina, like Augustine, was living in an empire where Christianity was secure, um, it was encouraged. Most of the Roman empires were, uh, emperors were Christian. So you might ask the same question that I asked with Augustine. So what crisis? Macrina was living a little bit earlier than Augustine and in a different part of the empire. She didn't face the same kind of threat from outside. What she faced was a threat from nature. So in 362 of the Common Era, we know that there was a terrible famine in that area. We know this from archaeological records as well as from history texts. And we're told that Macrina and her community responded to this with great works of charity. They used to, it is said, go out on the roads around the aristocratic estate where they lived. And they used to pick up children from the roadside, children who had been abandoned by their parents who could no longer afford to feed them. So two women responding to two different kinds of crises, but both of them rejecting what society expected of them, marriage and a family. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an example here of why I find it so fascinating to study early Christian history. These four people were bound together by many common beliefs, but they lived in different periods. They responded to things differently if they were men or women. And I'm really fascinated by the way in which history allows us, so far as we're able, to look at the particularity of their lives. But it also makes me think about my own context as well and to makes me reflect that even as we face our own crises today, we too need to investigate them with care and attention to what makes our own individual contexts particular. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>